Welcome everyone to our virtual International Women's Day celebration. Black women struggling for democracy and socialism. My name is Reverend Annie Allen. I am your moderator for this evening. I'm a theologian, a seminary professor, a church pastor, an activist, and a long lifetime member of the Communist Party USA. The Communist Party is delighted to welcome this panel of distinguished women presenters tonight. The program will be as follows. I will begin with a brief presentation of four distinguished women of our party who have dedicated their lives to the struggle. Linda Berman is with us, and she will present on her mother, Dorothy Berman, who is a longtime party activist and civil rights leader. Lisa Brock is with us tonight, and she will present on Charlene Mitchell. We will have a video greeting by the renowned Angela Davis. C.J. Atkins, the managing editor of The People's World, will give a presentation, and we will have closing remarks by comrade Rosanna Cameron. I will begin a note to our Zoom participants. You are, our tech people will mute everyone and will, as a courtesy to our speakers, we will all be muted. We ask that our speakers unmute themselves at the time um, of their presentations. So I will begin and bear with me for one quick minute. I have a brief uh, presentation that I would like to share on freedom is a constant struggle. Black women in the struggle for democracy, justice and socialism. We have four women tonight to honor. The first is Elizabeth Catlett. She was born in 1912 in Washington DC to a family of teachers in the district, in the district's public schools. For college, Although Elizabeth had been accepted into Carnegie, she was denied admittance to the institution after they discovered that she was black. In the end, she attended Howard University where she completed her bachelor's degree. After Howard, Elizabeth studied painting sculpture at the University of Iowa's graduate studies program. She also studied ceramics and lithography at the Chicago art community. In Chicago, she met and married Charles White. She and White traveled to Mexico in the 1940s to study and work as artists. Once there, she became an artist educated, she became active in artist education projects and labor union struggles. In 1949, after several years of deep involvement in Mexican labor struggles, she was declared an undesirable alien by the United States Department, US State Department, which refused her re-entry into the United States. Hadley continued to work in the artist activist community in Mexico until the early 1970s, when a letter writing campaign forced the US government to reverse its decision to refuse her entry into the country. Most of Elizabeth's work is sculpture and print work, which she is defined as a modernist and social realist. The subject of her work were mostly black women and they represented black women's struggles in the work and households against racism and for liberation. In this slide, you can see Catlett's most well-known works. The first of her works is a linoleum cut print sharecropper, which was made in 1952. The second image depicts a bronze relief sculpture that is predominantly displayed at Howard University. 
Catlett's work was a pop was popularized during the Black Arts Movement in the 1960s and 70s. Since then, her work is shown in museums, studios, and universities all over the world. She was a comrade, companion, and collaborator with many great African American and Mexican artists, such as White, Jacob Lawrence, Aaron Douglas, Margaret Walker, Ralph Ellison, Paul Robeson, Frito Kahlo, David Alfaro, Sequelo. Elizabeth Cartlett passed away in, 19, in 2012, a lifelong member of the Communist Party. Our next heroine is Etta Furlong, nurse and labor union leader. Born in 1910 in Missouri, Furlong moved to Furlow moved to Chicago in the 1940s to pursue her studies in nursing. Having received her certificate for a massage and physical therapy in 1947, she became a licensed practical nurse in the state of Illinois in 1959. Upon receiving her diploma, she moved to St. Paul, Minnesota in 1960 with her husband, James Furlow, to work as an integrated in an integrated hospital. During this period, she embraced her role as labor organizer, leading the fight to integrate the Minnesota Practical Nurse Association, the predecessor of the Minnesota Licensed Practical Nurse Association today. A fierce advocate for black women, she pushed for integration, respect, and unity in Minnesota Soda's Nurses Association. At a furlough taught that under capitalism, we are pressured to neglect cooperation and co collectivity for individualism and to value material consumption over our health, community, and well being. She explained the, excesses, the excessive pressure placed on women for wage labor and increased competition competition among women in the capitalist workplace. And I quote, a situation which polarizes rather than unites women is not progress, she said. As a pediatric nurse for many of her professional years, Furlow uplifted reproductive labor. The work women do that is life-sustaining, domestic work and raising children, keeping themselves, their families and others around us healthy, safe, fed, clean, cared for, and thriving. The world depends on women and women depend on each other, she said. She was well known in the Bill Heron Club of the Communist Party and the St. Paul, and in St. Paul, and in the community as Queen Mother for her tireless efforts in fighting for the rights of African-Americans, women, and the working class in Minnesota. In 1983, the, Saint, the city of St. Paul declared February 27th at a furlough day to honor her receipt of the Rosa Parks Award in recognition of her leadership in the fight against racist and unjust practices on local, state, and national issues. At a furlough dot passed away on, in 1989, leaving the legacy of leadership and struggle we all share today. Etta Griffin, a civil rights leader. Born in 1909 in Kentucky, Edna Griffin was, was a woman on the move. She grew up partially in New Hampshire and attended high school in Massachusetts. She completed a degree in English at Fisk University, a historically black university in Nashville, Tennessee in early 1930s. Her goal was to become a teacher, but she turned into a lifelong revolutionary. During her time at Fisk, she met and married Stanley Griffin, a pre-med student. Together they became politically active and in anti-fascist and civil rights struggles. During World War II, Griffin joined the U.S. Army, where she served with distinction. In 1947, Edna and Stanley moved to Des Moines, Iowa, 
with their three children where Stanley intends to study at medical school. In 1947 and 1948, Griffith campaigned on behalf of progressive party candidate Henry Wallace. She led an anti-segregation struggle at one of the local department stores in that city a year after a year long fight involving mass protests and civil rights lawsuits, Griffith and her comrades declared victory. A few years later, Griffith founded the local chapter of the Congress for Racial Equality, an organization protest, protests against racist violence and mobilized Iowans to the famous 1963 March on Washington. She was a local backer of Shirley Chisholm, historic presidential campaign for the Democratic Party's nomination in 1972, and regularly organized protests against war and nuclear proliferation. Griffith was recognized for her life struggle by the Iowa Civil Rights Commission in 1990 and the State named a building and a bridge after the civil rights fighter. Griffith passed away in 2000 and continues to inspire new generations of organizers and struggles for freedom, equality, and socialism. Debbie Bell, teacher and civil rights activist. Bell was founder of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC a leader of the, the Philadelphia Federation of Teachers and of its parent union, the American Federation of Teachers. As a teacher and militant trade unionist, she was a Philadelphia labor movement leader. She was, in, she was a national committee member of the Communist Party USA and a leader of the party's Philadelphia district organization. Bell was born Debbie Amos, to an African-American father, an organizer with the Communist Party and a Jewish mother. Following her graduation from college in 1961 and determined to contribute to the burgeoning civil rights movement, Bell drove to Atlanta where she applied for a job with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. She refused the desk job as a secretary of the office saying, quote, I am not going to accept a traditionally female position. She took the position as community organizer and described it as a hard 24 hour a day job. Her major assignment was to work with community schools, churches and black business community to desegregate the, reg the restaurants and businesses in Atlanta. She worked with other SNCC organizers to canvas streets and campuses, talk with churches, and hold rallies and meetings to recruit the community to picket, march, and sit in. After being arrested in 1964 during one of the numerous actions in the city, the FBI visited the SNCC offices where she had worked to inform, that, inform them that she was a communist. While in jail, she faced solitary confinement and threats from her jailers because of her politics. Finally, after her release and being denied a position at SNCC, Bell returned to Philadelphia to begin her career as a teacher and union leader that lasted for the next 40 years. Today, we give tribute to Elizabeth Catlett Edda Furlow, Edna Griffith, and Debbie Bell for their vision, courage, determination to bring justice, democracy, and socialism to our country and to all people. And I will now like to invite our first panelist, Linda Berman. Linda will present on her mother, Dorothy Berman, who is a longtime party activist and civil rights leader. Linda, you can unmute yourself and I will mute myself.
Thank you so much. And uh, thank you for this opportunity to be in conversation with you all. Um, I really, really do appreciate it. And I want to bring you mom's greetings. Mom is um, living up in Boston, Massachusetts now, and she's headed for her 108th birthday on March 22nd. Uh, she couldn't be with you all, but I'm here in her stead. And I just want to um, talk a little bit about mom's uh, life and her journey uh, to the Communist Party, uh, how she became a member and what her work looked like. This is a really informal <laughs> presentation, so you'll forgive me. Um, so mom, or Dorothy Burnham, was born in... Uh, 1915 in Brooklyn, New York, and she's the daughter of immigrants from Barbados. Both her mom and her dad uh, came from Barbados in the early part of the 20th century. Her mom in about 1907, her dad a couple of years later in uh, about 1910. He uh, was an illegal immigrant, he jumped ship. Um, and, oh, here's a picture of mom <laughs> in California visiting with me in COVID. Uh, she was um, gonna have her 105th birthday uh, party at the time. It was her first Zoom, but not her last Zoom birthday party. In any case, um, so her, her parents, as I say, were from Barbados and her mom was what they used to call a baby nurse. Uh, uh, nanny and also took in um, piecework, sewing. So at a, a time when uh, black women could uh, do factory work in their homes, they were not uh, hired by the factories, discrimination in uh, New York. But she did uh, piecework at home and, and um, mom's father, Frederick Chaloner was um, a super janitor in a building. And they lived on Waverly Avenue and her mom uh, chose that the house that they lived in on Waverly Avenue in Clinton Hill. This was a time when working people could afford to buy a house in Brooklyn. So, you know, it was a long time ago. Um, and her mom chose that house because it was right next door to the school and they had a deep interest in Dorothy's education. Uh, so, uh, mom was raised, born and raised in Brooklyn and took an early interest. This is, uh, you're looking at a picture of her 100th birthday party. She's sitting next to Esther Cooper Jackson, who was a, uh, they were very close friends from their 20s on. Um, so uh, mom went to uh, Girls High in Brooklyn. She had a strong interest in the sciences and she went to Brooklyn College. She wanted to be a doctor. Her family did not have the means to send her to medical school. Mom studied uh, biology at uh, Brooklyn College. She got both her bachelor's degree and eventually her master's degree at Brooklyn College. And it's also at Brooklyn College that she was radicalized by professors. Um, she became a radical in the 30s. Um, uh, partly also inspired at that time by one of the first uh, cases that made, was kind of raised to the level of national news, largely due to the efforts of the CPUSA. And that was the uh, issue of the Scottsboro Boys, in the early 1930s. Um, everybody knows about that case. And this is mom at her 75th uh, college graduation, her 75th reunion. There were only two of them to reunite at that 75th reunion. Um, so mom was radicalized in college. Um, there were also young radicals at the time at the YWCA in, uh, in Brooklyn. And uh, she eventually came within the orbit of the CPUSA. It's also during the 30s that uh, my mom meets uh, my dad, Louis E. Burnham, and they get married sometime in the late 30s. And uh, both of them uh, by this time are members of the CPUSA. I can't tell you the exact date, 
uh, at which mom, either mom or dad joins, but it's sometime in the 1930s. So uh, dad gets radicalized in the context of Harlem radicalism. He, he was raised in Harlem and, and also he went to uh, the City College of, of uh, New York and became radicalized in that context. So both of them joined the CP USA sometime in the late 30s. In the 40s, um, in the early 40s, sometime around maybe 41, 42, uh, mom and dad moved to Birmingham, Alabama to become organizers in a organization called the Southern Negro Youth Congress. Uh, the Southern Negro Youth Congress given the segregation in uh, Birmingham and across the South um, at the time, the Southern Negro Youth Congress was a way to bring young people together to engage in uh, discussing and debating the politics of the nation and policy at a time when the right to vote was severely uh, prescribed. Um, and so, uh, my dad organized across the South uh, throughout the 40s in uh, the Southern Negro Youth Congress, along with uh, Esther Jackson and James Jackson uh, and my mom. And it's also in those Birmingham years, my two sisters, uh, Margaret and Claudia, were, were born in Birmingham. And it's in those Birmingham years, they uh, move into, uh, when they get to Birmingham, they move to a housing project. And uh, their cross the way neighbors were uh, Sally and B. Frank Davis. And um, they begin to organize together around the conditions in the, uh, uh, in the housing project, uh, which didn't have um, indoor plumbing, the white housing projects did. And in the course of that, mom and Sally become lifelong friends. And um, Sally and B. Frank Davis are the parents uh, of Angela Davis, who I think you're gonna hear from a little bit later on today. But that, that friendship lasted from the early 40s all the way uh, till Sa uh, B. Frank and, and Sally passed. This picture that you're looking at here, I think is probably a SNCC, uh, uh, an event organized by the Southern Negro Youth Congress. You'll see mom, in these, both of them look very snazzy, both mom and Esther. So that's Esther over there on the right next to the, I guess it's a trumpet player and my mom um, in these white shoes. So it looks like it's a cultural event for the Southern Negro Youth Congress. That organizing went uh, well into the, into the late forties, but in the late forties, of course, the McCarthy period and uh, the, the, the ways in which anti-communism um, functioned in the US, uh, they, they were essentially squeezed out of that work. And that's a, that's a, there's a long story there. Um, it involves the Henry Wallace campaign and a visit to Birmingham by Henry Wallace's um, vice presidential, who was on the, the vice president on the Henry Wallace ticket in 1948, uh, was Glenn Taylor and the insistence by Birmingham authorities that, that, that his um, visit to Birmingham uh, and the event around him be segregated. Um, long story short, um, Bull Connor uh, essentially says, uh, has a conversation with my dad along the lines of, there's not room enough in this town for both of us and I'm not going anywhere. So um, that was taken as the kind of threat that it was and my parents um, moved back to New York City in uh, 1949. Um, in, the, in the 1950s, they, they eventually settle on Cambridge Place in, in uh, Bedford Stuyvesant, Cambridge Place and Fulton Street. And I'll say that there was a really rich um, combination of uh, Black, uh, communists in that neighborhood. So we lived uh, just two, three door uh, streets away from the Jacksons who run St. James Place, Esther uh, and Jack and their children and across the street from Ed and Augusta Strong who were also um, 
stalwarts in the in the Communist Party. Mom, um, she becomes a you know professional. She takes up her profession. Uh, she works largely in labs, micro, she's a, becomes a microbiologist. <laughs> I think one of mom's only disappointments in life is uh, that none of her children followed her path into the sciences. Um, but she, she becomes a microbiologist and works in labs at um, what used to be called the Hospital for Joint Diseases. It has a different name now and also at Sloan Kettering. She works in those um, hospitals for years and years and then later on also becomes uh, a teacher at Empire State College. And at Empire State, there's a scholarship um, in her name. She became a really dedicated teacher. She loved teaching. She taught both um, biology and um, bioethics. A lot of her students were people who were already in the health field, but didn't have the paperwork for it. And she always talked about how much she learned from her students. She was also throughout this period, she continued her activism. And so in the, um, in the 19, let's see, in the 1960s and 70s, um, she ends up working, especially in the 1970s with uh, something called the uh, Women for Racial and Economic Equality. I'm sure many of you have heard of that organization. In the 1980s, she works with an organization called Sisters Against South African Apartheid that was based at Reverend Dowtry's church. Um, she also works with, worked with a group called Genes and Gender. And so she continued her both her interest in not only biology, but the politics around biology and uh, some of the biodeterminism on the, uh, on the uh, part of uh, scientists a more right-leaning um, <laughs> orientation. And uh, genes and gender was a early case of um, bringing science uh, and the vision of science to feminism, melding uh, scientific approach and, and, uh, and early feminism. Uh, mom also, I'll just say a couple more things. Mom also, um, once we were all out of the house <laughs> and so sufficient, uh, because she was a teacher, she had her summers off and she um, took to traveling uh, year after year, something she really uh, loved a lot. She uh, traveled to uh, Africa over and over again, many times over. And I will say that uh, mom sustained and sustains her interest, especially in world peace, um, especially in racial justice, especially in how people uh, organize to bring about world peace, which uh, seems fairly distant at the present moment. But um, I will say that uh, her, the ways in which those uh, values got embedded in her early on through her work with the, um, CPUSA, she uh, carried those values uh, and has continued to carry those values all um, throughout throughout her life. Um, so I, I think that's I think that's about um, what I'll say about mom. She's been, I have to say, a most loving mother and a really um, close friend to many, 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 many people and valued her uh, years and her learnings in the CPUSA uh, for the decades uh, during which she was an active member. So thank you all so much. Linda, thank you. Linda, thank you for that beautiful testimony and uh, fascinating, fascinating story of your mother's life. And I have heard her name many, many times over. I can't believe I've been a member of this party 47 years. And uh, I, I, I did the math while you were talking. I was like, oh, and uh, she's, she's a giant and, and you. And uh, we're grateful to, 
to have you on the panel and have you uh, share uh, so many details about your mom's life, which is just beautiful. We thank you for that. Thank you so much. Our next presenter is Dr. Lisa Brock. Lisa Brock is a professor emerita of the Kalamazoo College. She is a early member of the, um, the NAARPR, the National Alliance in Washington, D.C., and a lifelong organizer, activist, and internationalist. Lisa, welcome to the panel, and uh, we look forward to your presentation. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, Linda has put me to shame because I don't have a bio of Charlene um, to, to offer, um, although I would uh, steer people to an article based on a set of interviews I did with Charlene. Um, there's a book called No Easy Victories. African liberation and American activists over half a century. And um, I included Charlene um, in that piece that I wrote for that book some years ago. Um, you know, it's interesting, you know, Charlene just passed away. Um, she had been in a nursing home for some time after a devastating stroke. Uh, she was a longtime member of the CPUSA. And then in the 90s, I believe, uh, she left the party and became a founder of the Committees of Correspondence for Democracy and Socialism, a leader of that and a founder of that. Um, I knew Charlene um, from the 1970s um, all the way until her, her passing away. Um, I never lived in New York, so I didn't know her like some of other people in New York knew her, but I did know her as a mentor. And, um, you know, when I was thinking about Charlene, I, I, I tried to write a poem. Um, Joe Sims might remember when we were at Oberlin together in our, our, our first years, literally I met Joe Sims when I was 18 at Oberlin College. And uh, I fashioned myself as a poet. But the more and more I got into intellectual work and writing history and politics, uh, poetry kind of becomes more prose. But I'm trying to get back into my poetry. So I tried to find a poem for Charlene uh, to honor her in a way that spoke to how I felt. I looked at Maya, Lucille, Tony Cade, and Nikki, and many more. Wonderful poets writing from the bellies of Black women. And yet nothing was specific enough, tight enough, broad enough, radical enough, sly eyed enough, quick tongue enough, precious nor politically left enough. If I were still a professor, I would give my students a bio of Charlene and assign them to find a poem, the right poem, the exact poem to serve as a eulogy for her. Maybe then one would be discovered. But for now, I write my own, an elegy for Charlene. From the 25th floor of your Harlem apartment, you ruled the world. Your house was a temple, your mind a school, your noisy second bedroom a sanctuary. The coordinates of 25F I always forgot until I got off the elevator and saw that door sticker of Nelson Mandela, marking your intentions to the world. When I think of you, dear Charlene, I think of a tower, never uprooted from the bedrock of your foundation, yet like a skyscraper, you would bend and sway with the gust of time, always strategic, always tactical, always mobilizing. A radical love of our people, all people, grounded you, uplifted you, and kept you moving. I saw you cry only once when I interviewed you about living with no name, no comrades, and a new baby underground. A bleak memory of sorrow, anger, and hurt. Fittingly, the fight for civil rights and anti-colonialism broke that ugly fascist back and justice movements ushered you home to Harlem. Thank you, thank you, thank you, dear Charlene, as you move to the great socialist community in the sky, the earth, the air, the water. I wish you a poker game in which you must win, a mystery novel that you share with others, 
and a worthy community to organize. Thank you, Lisa, for that beautiful tribute and your know, personal reflection. That was lovely and um, and touching. Thank you. We will now have a video greeting and tribute from Angela Davis. facilitated by our able tech people. <laughs> it's coming. Yeah. We'll find the video, um, but if you could move on in the program, and I'll hey. see when we have it. Well, see, uh, CJ Atkins is up, and I see his screen is here, so I'm assuming you're, there you are. And yeah, I'm here. CJ is the managing editor of the People's World, and he has a, a message and appeal for us. All right, thanks very much. You can hear me all right, yes? Just fine. Okay, good. Okay, yeah, I'm coming to you uh, from Chicago, where I'm here for uh, some meetings with the other People's World staff. We're going to be uh, strategizing tomorrow the, the calendar for the newspaper coming up this, this year, all of the events that we need to be covering. And so, you know, one thing that all the, the people who were discussed this evening had in common uh, is that they were all supporters of People's World, and a lot of them were writers for the paper over many years. And today it's still bringing uh, the news and the analysis of all the various struggles that, that have been talked about tonight. And so we just wanna come to, to all the attendees tonight and ask you if you can uh, to help support the paper, keep it going, keep this mission alive that so many of these wonderful women were devoted to also. Uh, so we wanna ask if you can check out uh, peoplesworld.org slash donate. We're in the middle of our fund drive right now trying to raise $125,000 uh, by May Day. Uh, the money to keep this paper going right now. We're, we're just barely in the black, but we need the help to stay that way. So if you can go online and, and make a donation, or if you're able to become a sustainer, uh, we really depend on that, that reliable monthly income. Uh, so if you can become a monthly sustainer of any amount, uh, you can do that at the, that same address, peoplesworld.org slash donate. Uh, I had to come outside to speak to you where I'm at with the other uh, People's World staff. It's kind of loud in there but I, uh, I've been listening in throughout the presentation and enjoying enjoying uh, all the information that's shared. So thanks very much and, and have a good evening with the rest of the program. Thank you, CJ. We appreciate you and all that you do. And we, we definitely appreciate the people's world and all the, I get, I get, I get it electronically daily. And I am, uh, we're all very, very grateful for the work that you do as well. And I have been told that our video is, our video tribute is ready. We might consider this to be the perfect time to celebrate the historical contributions of Black women. We are at the end of Black History Month and on the cusp of Women's History Month. But, of course, we cannot assume that the part played by Black women in advancing freedom and radical democracy in the United States and the world can be so easily contained within these months devoted to the special recognition of Black people and to women of all racial backgrounds. And in fact, Charlene Mitchell's life and work exceed all such efforts to contain them under neat rubrics. She was the most consistent opponent of racism I have ever known. But if we speak of activists and thinkers who were proponents of theories and strategies grounded in intersectionality, 
We should recognize that her opposition to racism was grounded in her lifelong resistance to capitalism and thus to the cause of working class liberation. Following such phenomenal historical figures as communists, Claudia Jones and her essay and into the neglect of the problems of Negro women, Esther Jackson and her master's thesis and her master's thesis on black women domestic workers, journalists Marvell Cook and, and, and in fact Ella Baker who co-authored an expose of the super exploitation of black women domestic workers. Um, Charlene knew that as much as black women had been pushed to the periphery of history, it was black women who were at the very center of struggles for radical democracy. Charlene belonged to what was often referred to as the lost generation in communist and radical activism because she refused to be frightened away by the fascist efforts of McCarthy. In fact, as a very young activist, she worked underground assisting members of the Communist Party who had been successful in eluding the FBI. Charlene was the person who most persuaded me that it was possible not only to live a life devoted to radical activism, but that one could find joy in that work. She helped me understand the importance of Black music and especially jazz. Although I already knew that music was an especially important dimension and struggle, the way Charlene knitted together culture and politics had a profound impact on me and so many others. Her approach exemplified how jazz could be integrally incorporated into and could organically inspire freedom movements. I would place her appreciation of jazz on a par with her political commitment. Considering the recorded music she collected, her attendance at at, at live jazz concerts and the friendships she cultivated with jazz musicians. When, for example, I see Abdullah Ibrahim, uh, whom we first knew as Dollar Brand, uh, whenever, whenever I see him, we inevitably express to each other our love for Charlene and um, how she recognized that music was such an important dimension of the struggle for freedom. Of course, I could talk about Charlene for many hours, but since the time allocated for this brief statement is already up, I want to conclude by saying that I know that my own life and the lives of so many others would not have unfolded as they did without the formative influence of Charlene Mitchell. I literally owe my life to her as she was the central figure in the movement for my freedom. And those of us who continue to work toward the abolition of carceral institutions in our world, even though many may not realize it, are standing on the very strong shoulders of Charlene Mitchell. And it is now, that's lovely, it is now time for our closing remarks. And I'm going to invite Rosanna Cameron to share her thoughts and final reflections with us. Thank you, Comrade Annie. Uh, you know, happy International Women's Day to everyone. It's been a really inspiring program. And thank you to the African-American Commission and the New York District who have helped put this, this uh, event together for us. 
It's so important that we bring to light the long covered up stories of women like Etta Furrow, Edna Griffin, Elizabeth Catlett, and Debbie Bell. If we don't do it, who will? Women, black, brown, Asian, and white have made have made and are continuing to make important contributions to the fight for democracy and socialism. Progress in the long and difficult freedom, fight for freedom, justice, and against sexism would have been inconceivable without the names of Mother Jones, Mother Blur, Claudia Jones, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, Emma Tenayaka, Tenayuka, excuse me, Fern Wils Winston, Esther Jackson, Angela Davis, and countless others. We want to give a special thanks to Linda Bergman and Lisa Brock for sharing the contributions of comrade Dorothy Bergman and Charlene Mitchell, both of whom made outstanding contributions going back decades, contributions we acknowledge, respect, study, and draw lessons from. Our history with all the, su with all the successes and failures, triumphs and mistakes are ours. We learn and we grow from it. Linda, Please say, send our love to Dorothy and wish her a happy 108th birthday. And Lisa, please know we are deeply saddened by, the com by Comrade Charlene's passing, and we send our condolences to the family, comrades, and friends. We will join you at the upcoming memorials honoring our outstanding our revolutionary activist, Charlene Mitchell Presente. We need the rich legacy of all of these women as we confront today's challenges unity in the first place. There have been few times, if ever, that the assault of democracy has been as fierce. The Supreme Court has gutted reproductive rights, trans rights are trampled upon, and voting rights are systematically being undermined. But as the midterm election showed, women are fighting back and men are joining them. Together, all of us, black, brown, Asian and white, straight and LGBTQ, young and old, citizen and undocumented immigrant, are more than a match for those who want to take the country backwards. Let us end today's program inspired by the courage, vision, and steadfastness of the women we have learned about today. Happy International Women's Day. Thank you. Rosanna, Rosanna thank you. Thank you to all of our panelists, each and every one of you. Thank you to Yosins for helping to coordinate this event to Kay and Ani, who have been behind the scenes keeping all of the tech rolling, and know that we are with you, each and every one of you, and our Facebook participants. We wanted to thank you for tuning in and, uh, and watching this uh, webinar, and know that we are with each and every one of you in the struggle as you move forward for peace, justice, and socialism. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you.